Hey, good morning. Uh, have you ever felt like you don't belong? I have. One of the saddest stories of my life. I, I was a second grader and I, I switched schools at the beginning of the second grade year, thankfully. Um, and uh, I was scared as any second grader will be. I was, I was pretty, I was a pretty cool kid in kindergarten and first grade. Girl kissed me on the cheek and everything. And uh, and then I'm transferring schools to a school where I where I don't know anybody. And the only thing that made it okay is that my cousin Felicia was going to be at the school. So I had a built-in friend. She was going to be a first grader. I was a second grader. And so I kind of had some hope. I felt like everything was going to be okay. And then about a week into the year, she, she decided or her parents decided, I don't know whose fault this is, Sandy and Paul, it might be your fault there in the back, but uh, that, that, that she was going to go to a private school. And, and all of a sudden, I had no friends. And I remember, I could show you right at Kennedy Elementary in Kaiser, Oregon, where I was standing. I remember standing at recess and just peering out at all the kids playing and having fun and, and tears filling my eyes. I know, I'm, I'm lucky that I turned out to be an okay person <laughs> after Paul and Sandy took their daughter away. Um, uh, but it was this moment where, where I just... I didn't, I didn't belong. Like there was, there was no group. There was no set of people. There was, there was nobody for me to connect to, to play with at that age. I, I didn't know what to do. It wasn't dissimilar. This makes me sound like I had no friends ever. But, but entering high school, I had not quite the same because uh, by that time, I, my sports life had taken off. So I always had built-in friends. But so many of my friends, my freshman year of high school, just started partying and it uh, wasn't something I wanted to do, not probably because of morality, but because I didn't want to get in trouble and I really liked sports. And, and so all of a sudden I went from like, you know, a lot of friends in middle school uh, that I had gained between first grade and eighth grade. And then all of a sudden it was like, ah, we're still cool, but, but like, who do I hang out with now? Like, who am I going to, what group am I going to be a part of? And you know, if you've ever seen any high school show at all, right? Like how important that is to, to be a part of a group. And, and I didn't know what group to be a part of because my athlete friends, the majority of them were, were living lives that I was unwilling to live um, because I didn't want to get in trouble. And, and probably each of us, I hope, maybe it's just me, but probably all of us in this room, Almost everybody has a story of, of when they felt like they didn't belong. And, and with a lack of belonging uh, comes like a sense of sadness and a sense of, I think this is how I would describe it, like lostness, right? Like, like it's hard to find purpose if you don't feel like you belong to a group. Within every group, you, you feel like, like you have a job to do, right? Whether you're the funny guy or the smart guy or the, the cool person or whatever, you feel like you, know, you have a purpose in that group. But when you're without a group, you're just kind of this island and it, it feels, I don't know, it, it feels like being lost a little bit. Um, it's one of the reasons I had, as I was preparing the sermon, I thought about this, but when I was growing up, for whatever reason, in white suburban America, uh, there was a lot of talk of, of gangs, and I don't know if, if gangs have become less of a thing in the last 25 years, or if uh, we just don't hear about them, media's picking other topics now to talk about, but like, growing up in white suburban America, I remember real conversations, like this was a possibility for little Chad Harms crying on the playground, but where my parents and the teachers were like telling us, never join a gang, you know, it's like, I'm never going to meet anybody in a gang, but, uh, but like, this was a big deal, it was on the news all the time, uh, it, it was like a, a real part of our lives, and, and I remember thinking as, you know, your your dad or your teacher describes gangs and what they do to you like like how could I ever end up in one of those right I'm not interested in shooting people you know I don't want to get beat up to get initiated none of this sounds good but when you peel back the layers right like like what you find about gangs is it's it's really about a sense of belonging that's what that's what moves people into gangs bad home life it's rough they need somebody, they need some people 
to belong to, in order to find purpose, in order to find help, in order to find all the things that we find when we, when we belong. In that regard, I guess, while a gang is not a, a good place to belong, it, it makes sense, right? If you didn't belong to anything, if you just found yourself being a kid, crying at recess, not knowing that your parents loved you, you're gonna look for somebody. And, and as we talk about being a sojourner on earth, Christians being citizens of heaven, but yet living in this earth, traveling through, passing by, I didn't, I didn't think that I wouldn't have told you that, that belonging was going to come up. But in the passage we're gonna look at today, what's so clear as Paul writes this is, is that we will do a good job of navigating the cultural shifts that move away from Christianity that no longer align with our morality or our beliefs. We'll do a better job of navigating that if we really understand that, that we belong and we belong to God, his family and his kingdom. And I think that this is really important and this is, this is kind of what we're gonna do today is what we're gonna look at this passage and, and, and I think this is what's really at the heart of it at least for us this morning is, is that with a sense of belonging comes a sense of gratitude and a, res, a sense of, of responsibility. I've told you this in a sermon before with other intents and purposes, but uh, that day after I cried at recess um, as a six-year-old, I went home. I guess my dad said, how was your day? I guess I wasn't in the mood to say fine. And, and I must have said like, well, it was okay, except I just sat around crying at recess. And, and my dad said, look, here's the deal. You, you got, I, I don't, I'm not gonna promise that you'll ever make friends or anything like that, but I want you to learn one person's name every day. You just walk up to them and you say, you say, hey, what's your name? Whatever. He wanted to turn me into a real loser, I guess. Um, and and so, uh, so the next day, I, I'm pretty sure it was the very next day, um, I walked up to this kid named Yasser. I didn't know him at all. I said, what up? I'm Chad. Hey, uh, I don't have any friends, um, you know? And, and, and I don't know why. But Yasser, uh, he, he, he wanted to be my friend. And Yasser was a cool kid and, and all of a sudden I had the cool friends and, and my life was frankly changed in an instant because, because that one guy, uh, Yasser, uh, decided that he wanted to be my friend. And, and frankly, still to this day, I, I, I have a feeling of gratitude and, and I would, I would be there for him if he ever needed me to be there for him. Uh, he could have just made fun of me, kept walking, done whatever, but he, I, I don't even know how the conversation went, but he wanted to be friends. And, and this is how it works in our relationship with God. And I wanna start, this is gonna be kind of weird today because I'm gonna start at the end of, of Philippians chapter two and I wanna work backwards because Philippians chapter two verse 19 is, is about belonging and how as Christians we get to belong to something that, that we had frankly no business, no right to belong to and, and this is what it says. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. So with consequently, this is, this is a word that uh, points backwards, right? And that's why we're going to work backwards today. It's the word that's usually translated uh, therefore. And when you see therefore, you have to ask what it's there for. But consequently does a great job of saying, look, this belonging deal is the consequence of, of everything that's been said in the first 18 verses of this chapter of the Bible. Everything that this guy named Paul has written down to this point, but before we look backwards, I, I, want to, I want to just look at a couple things in this verse because they're really so important to, to us grasping how cool it is that we get to belong because if we don't grasp how cool it is that we get to belong in God's family, and God's household, then it's really, it's going to be hard for us to have the gratitude that we ought to have. And, and out of that, a lack of gratitude, then it's going to cause us to have a real difficult time doing what I talked about last week and I've already have alluded to here. But that's, that's navigating this culture, right? That, that is different than it used to be. When I was six years old, 
most people liked Christianity. Most people believed kind of Christian things even if they didn't live them out. Most people held to a morality that was Christian-like, but today that's no longer the case. And as Christians, we now live in this culture that is vastly different than, than what we believe. And the question for this series is how do we navigate that? And if we're going to answer that in a meaningful way, then we must, be grat- we must have gratitude for the fact that we belong. And, and in this verse, I mean, Paul says this, this really, this thing that we don't think about because I don't know, you've been a Christian for a long time. If you're a new Christian, you might think about this. But he says first, like you are no longer foreigners and strangers. And these words, uh, they're, they're important. Um, foreigners means, means this, not of one's family. And strangers means this, dwelling near. Have you ever gone to a, like a, a family gathering that isn't your own, like somebody else's family gathering? Um, my friend Neil, I don't know where you are, are you out there? Oh, whoa, right there. Um, uh, Neil and I are very close and Neil invites us to some of his family events every now and then. But the first time he ever did that, I don't, I've never even told him this, this is breaking the news, but he didn't really tell us it was like a family gathering. He just said, hey, come over, we'll hang out later. And so I don't even know what I was wearing. I would have dressed up, you know, or whatever. And, and, uh, and Bren and I, and, and I don't even, I don't know if Hazel was born yet, but so just Bren and I, I think we walk in and it's like, you know, 25 of Bren's, I mean, Neil's family members, and, and they're all great, they're all super cool, but it's not like being part of the family, right? Like, you're trying to get the, the norms and, like, do I need to, to, you know, like, put my napkin on my knee when we sit at the dinner table, and, like, can I say something funny, kind of mean about Neil, and it will be taken as a joke, or are they gonna be like, this guy's a jerk, you know? I, do you know, like, this dynamic, right? Like, it's a, even if you're with another family. If you're not part of it, it's really never going to be the same. I grew up uh, in a divorced home with vastly different sides of my family. And I can tell you that, that, so it was like, for me, I was like part of two families, right? And navigating those families was so utterly different as a kid. Like, it's like I'm one guy here and I'm one guy here and that's just how it works. Like, I I just became two people. Sounds a little crazier than I mean it, but that's, that's how it was for me. And, and what Paul is saying here is like, look, before you were a Christian, if you're not a Christian, then you were not part of the family. You weren't part of it. You may have gone to church, like you may have been around religious things, you may have grown up in a Christian home, but you're just an outsider. You may be there, but you don't really belong. That's what Paul's saying. And the other word, I mean, it's just like to be next to somebody, right? Like, how close do you feel to your neighbor? Most of us are like, oh, I kind of forgot they existed, you know? I mean, being in proximity to somebody is not the same as belonging to the group that they are a part of. And so Paul uses these two words that I think we get, right? Like two very clear, easy to understand words that are basically saying before you became a Christian, you didn't, you didn't belong. You weren't a part of God's family. You didn't belong to the household of God. Now I know we have this strange language that we kind of use. I don't know if it's an American thing or whatever, but we talk about everybody as God's children. Like I think people say that like, like, oh, we're all just God's children. But the Bible doesn't say that at all. I mean, that's just actually like really far from what the Bible says. The Bible kind of says like, we've, until we become Christians, until we are adopted by God because we have placed our faith in, in what he's done through his son Jesus, we live as enemies to God. We are strangers to God. We do not belong in God's family. But after we become Christians, we get to belong. And man, just one more time to illustrate a lack of belonging. Uh, this story only, uh, it, it closely connects, but it's, it's a sad story of, 
of not getting to be a part of something that I kept thinking about when I was trying to think about what it feels like to not belong. And uh, this story comes from my grandma when she was a little kid living in Sacramento. They were going on a field trip and uh, this this uh, kid that she went to school with was was poor, uh, very poor. And so I don't remember what the field trip was. It's unimportant to the story, but something that he's never going to be able to afford to do. And and, and so he's like more excited than any of her classmates and he's pumped up to go and he shows up on the day and he loads into the bus and the bus driver gets mad and a bus driver says something, my grandma can tell you the story better, but something to the effect of like, hey, next kid that talks is not gonna get to go on the field trip and, and the kid like whispers something to the person next to him and, and is kicked off the bus and doesn't get to go on the field trip. And it's this, been this story that I don't know why, I'm super emotional, I actually tried to, this is so weird, I know, uh, but I tried to find the guy through like the internet not long ago because I'm just curious about how his life turned out and my grandma has a first name and the school and her, her age and that's what I was going on. But you know, we live in 2018, there's still a shot. Um, uh, I emailed some people that are like in charge of the class get together still to see if I get a hold of them. But it, but it crushes me. I don't know why the story fills my eyes with tears, but I think it's because, because it's a story of, of a kid who is next to something, but didn't get to be a part of it. And, and Paul here says like, look, like you may, you may have been next to to the people of God, you may have gone to church, but until you give your life to God through Jesus, and we're gonna talk about that more in a minute, but until you do that, you're not really a part of it. And how sad it is to not be a part of something, right? And he says here that, that when we give our lives, that when we give our lives to God through Jesus, that we get to become fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. As I mentioned earlier, the Bible describes it as as adoption. And I mean, that's such a great picture, right? Of somebody getting to belong when before they did not. And so just for a moment, just consider how awesome it is, how important it is that God would allow us to belong to him, to his family, to his kingdom. As Christians, we belong. It doesn't matter how many people reject us on earth. It doesn't matter how many friends we don't have. We, we, we belong. And that's an incredible gift. Toy Story, perhaps the greatest scene in the whole franchise is, is this moment when Buzz Lightyear, you may remember this, Buzz Lightyear, we're all on the same page with Toy Story. That needs no explanation, right? Toy Story, um, <laughs> Buzz Lightyear realizes that he's just a toy. He thinks that he's actually a space ranger for like half the first movie. And then he, he says this to Woody, the other key character. He says, I'm just a stupid little insignificant toy. And then Woody looks back at him and says, you must not be thinking clearly. Look over in that house. There's a kid who thinks you're the greatest. And it's not because you're a space ranger. It's because you're his. Isn't that so good? And that's, that's, that's what we believe as Christians, that God, that we matter, that we frankly matter, that we have a place in this world, that we have a purpose, all because God looks at us and declares that we are his, that we're his. And that changes everything about how we navigate culture, right? When we live in light of belonging to God, being his, then it's a lens that we filter everything else through. But that becomes more, I think, impactful and important as we go backwards in this chapter, Philippians. Uh, excuse me, I said that earlier, but I meant Ephesians chapter two. And, and, and here's what verses 12 and 13 says. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you were one, who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. 
It says you weren't citizens of Israel and to not be a citizen of Israel is to not be a citizen of heaven is to not belong to God. If you're not Jewish, this was our plot in life and we forget that because we were born after Jesus came but, but for a Gentile, you know, living in the first century who was alive before Jesus was alive, I mean, you were Jewish or you were not Jewish and, and what Paul describes here is pretty bleak for a, a Gentile, somebody who wasn't a Jew. You were far from God. You had no place in the covenants or promises of God. That's bad. Being separated from God and the promises that come with God. I mean, like, I mean, we just, again, it's one of those things that in America we, we think, oh, God loves me and, and, and God will take care of me and God will make sure that I get into heaven. And what Paul says is like, none of that's, none of that's necessary. God does love you, but those other things are not true if you're not a Christian. God is maybe not gonna take care of you. God is not going to give you access to him. Your prayers are not going to reach him in any meaningful way. And we live post Jesus and so we have this, this just concept like, well, obviously God's on my side, but he's not. And it's not because God didn't wanna be on your side, it's because you've chosen to reject God. You sinned against him. I mean, Paul looks at these people and, and he says, look, the situation before you became Christians is one where you didn't belong. And, and because you didn't belong, the promises of God that are awesome, they're great, they didn't apply to you. And you did not have access to God. In fact, you were far away from God, even if you were near to the people of God. Proximity does not equal belonging. But, and here's where it gets really cool, God looked at you far away, you who are far away, we who are far away, and said, I wanna do something about that. And so he came in the person of Jesus, and, and what it says here is that we've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Because we forget how far away we are from God, we also forget how amazing it is that God would sacrifice everything to bring us near to him. When we just think everybody's a part of God's family, of course God listens to my prayers. Of course he'll grant me access into heaven. We're all God's children. Then it doesn't make what Jesus did on a cross very important. But when we remember we were far away from God because we had sinned against God, because we looked at God and said, I know what you've said, but I'm not gonna do it. Or we looked at God and said, I know what you said, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Then it makes what Jesus did by stepping out of the glories of heaven onto earth, living a sinless, perfect life, and then being crucified, nailed to a cross, all so that we could have access to God, way cooler, way more important. And it inspires a sense of gratitude in us because we look at God like I look at my friend Yasser and say, you didn't have to do that, but you did and it changed my life. I think that one of the reasons we don't navigate culture very well, we either just give in to, uh, in to the sins that the world presents to us or we're just mad at everybody. These are the two kind of sides that I said we're, we're falling on in Christian circles today. We, we navigate culture by just embracing it or just being angry about it. This seems to be how Christians are responding. But when you look at God and you say, wow, I was far from you. but you shed your blood so that I might belong to you. It doesn't leave you all angry and frustrated because you're just like, wow, that's so amazing. That grace is incredible. I feel joy. But it also doesn't allow you to say, well, God, I know you've said not to, but I don't really care. Because gratitude based on belonging, like I said, it compels us to live differently. It compels us to live, frankly, for the one who has granted us the belonging in the first place. But Paul, you know, going backwards, he, he says more. He says in Ephesians 2, 16 and 17, in one body to reconcile both, that's Jew and Gentile, both of them, to God through the cross 
by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. The Jewish people, I mean, they were, they were like God's chosen ones, right? We, we kind of know that. We think about that language. They had special access to God. They could go more closely to his presence in the temple. They were the ones who received the word of God that pointed to the Messiah. I mean, they had the laws of God. They had the favor of God. I mean, when you read the Old Testament, it's clear that as long as they're living in obedience, I mean, if they're going to a battle... God's on their side, right? I mean, we, it's pretty, it's obvious. I mean, they win battles where they have far less people and no weapons. And I mean, it's God's on their side. That'd be pretty cool to have God on our side, wouldn't it? And what Paul says here is, hey, it wasn't always this way. But because Jesus came and died, you can now be the chosen ones of God. You have the same access to God that the Jews have and you have it in exactly the same way. I think we we sometimes, I don't know, like I know a lot of people with low self-esteem and it seems like that trickles into how we think about God and we view God. And I think a lot of times like, like especially you, if you have a lower self-esteem, then then you think like, yeah, God loves me, but if only, you know, I, you know, was, was more gifted or more equipped or like God had created me in a better way or whatever. And Paul at the most, in the most rudimentary way says, all of us now have the same access to God. We all have been chosen called, gifted, equipped. He says that stuff other places in the same way. And it's through the body of Jesus that Jesus would willingly be mocked, beaten, tortured, and killed for our sins. God's leveled the playing field. There's no excuse for you to not belong anymore in a meaningful, important, valuable way that gives you gratitude and purpose. Anything else is just an excuse or a false humility. We should be celebrating this this ability that God has granted us where, where he has put to death hostility between the most, like the widest gap. You were in or you were out. You were Jew or you were Gentile. And God through Jesus has said like, hey, you all can be a part of my kingdom now. And in, in my kingdom, you have purpose. You have meaning. You have worth. You have value. Things that we all long for and want. They all come because God has granted us belonging that's incredible man i i I, uh, I watched this show recently and in the show there's this um this guy who's a sex trafficker and and there's there's a government official um for the united states of america and this government official is struggling to be in the presence of this guy, but they need him in order to accomplish their mission. That's kind of the story. And so they're paying this guy money to get the information they need. And they, but at the same time, like he just can't stand it. Like he's just looking at him and he's, he's, he hates him, right? Like he just hates what this guy stands for and what he's doing to women and cannot it's not being very nice he's being a jerk he's compromising the mission because he can't stand to be in his presence and and this guy um it's a sex trafficker says you think you're the good guy and i'm the bad guy maybe you're right but maybe if i was born in a nice city in america i could be the good guy too geography is destiny my friend the world is the kiln and we are the clay and, and frankly, what Paul says is, that was kind of true. That was true. But then Jesus came. And you can be the good guy too. You can be on the right team. And it's all because of Jesus. Jesus just broke down this geographical barrier and, and so many other barriers that stands, that stood in the way of us having access to God, of us belonging and I think we still make excuses. 
Like if I would have been born into the right family, if I would have been born in America, if I would have been born into uh, a different city that was, you know, more inclined to believe the gospel, then, then, then I would totally embrace this Christianity stuff. Then I would really belong. But Paul's like, no, 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 no. There's no more excuse because those barriers were torn down in the person of Jesus and we all have access to God the Father. We all have access to God. We can all belong because of Jesus, not because of where we were born or who we were born to. And even he even takes it a step back and, and, and it's like he's already dealt with this other excuse like, but I'm not good enough. Because in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This is a huge, it's a huge statement in scripture because it's so clear, like you can never work your way into belonging. This doesn't work like a kid getting kicked off the bus. We all talked We all deserved to get kicked off the bus, to not belong, to be next to, to know about, to be close but not in. But through Jesus and his incredible grace, the gift of God, we can be saved. We can be saved from our sin, we can be saved from hell, and we can be saved, and we forget about this as Christians, we can be saved into a relationship with God. We can be saved into the family of God, into the kingdom of God. We can become citizens of heaven. And that's the choice that Paul leaves us in this passage. You can be citizens of earth or you can be citizens of heaven. And I think that we all know intuitively that belonging to earth and only earth sucks. It just, it still leaves us purposeless it still leaves us feeling like, does anybody really love me? It still leaves us stuck in our sins. If we fully embrace this belonging on earth, it's really, really bad because earth is is really, really bad. I mean, there's good moments, right? We long for vacation because we know that, (laughs) that our normal lives are just not that great, even when they're pretty good. My dad said it to me the other day when I was leaving for Coeur d'Alene. He said, you know what's great about vacation? You can pretend that this is real life for a while. And we did. But then you come back and there's still problems and struggles and pain and hurt. To be a citizen of earth is not that great. And God's saying you can be citizens of earth or you can be citizens of heaven. And with being a citizen of heaven, you get granted granted access into the promises of God, the future of God, the the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the hope of God, the peace of God. It's so much better, so much better. But with that belonging, and hopefully the gratitude that comes from it is is this responsibility. And and this, all that was, was just set up for these last three verses because you won't live like this if you don't really care that God has allowed you to belong. At the beginning of this chapter, verses I didn't read, Paul talked about what it was like to live as a citizen of earth, and it's not very good, it's bleak, it's bad. But at the end, he says, no, 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 no. It's no longer that way for you who have given your lives to Jesus because you believe that he died for your sins. He says, this is the new purpose. This is what it's about. He says, you're part of the household of God. And then he switches metaphors. And Chuck, who preached a few weeks ago, said that he he likes when metaphors get switched. I hate it. Uh, (laughs) It's like, if I didn't believe the Bible was inspired by God, then I'd be like, Paul just messed this up. Should have stuck with the same metaphor. But he switches metaphors. He goes from family to citizenship into a building metaphor. And this is what he says, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. 
in him the whole building is joined together and rises, notice this, to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Jesus is the chief cornerstone of this building. That means that probably two things. One, he bears the weight and two, he sets the line. He bears the weight. I mean, it's, it's ultimately, it falls to him. He's the one doing the work. He's the one that is building us. He is the one that is turning Christians into something important and valuable on earth. But he's also the one that, that sets the line and shows us how we ought to live and how we ought to interact with people and what we ought to do and all of those things. The apostles are the primary foundation. That means their ministry and their work, but that also means the, the written word that they have given us in the Bible that that God inspired them to write down for us. But we who are Christians who have come to belong are being built into the place, this is such a big responsibility, the place of God's presence on earth. Our sense, with our sense of belonging should come an understanding that we, this sounds so much colder and less warm and fuzzy, but we are, we are a brick in the presence of God on earth. It all happens in Jesus, but that's our job. Now that's that's kind of a big responsibility, right? And and one that we won't live out if we if we don't understand what it costs God for us to really belong to his kingdom and to his family. But it's the responsibility that we have been left with. And as we continue to talk about sojourning, living lives of passers through on this earth, living in a place that isn't our home, and we think about what does that mean for how I deal with culture? And I've said, this is hard. These are hard questions. Like, what do I do when, when everybody's saying, like, hey, you're either right on this side or right on this side? And, and Christians, what do you think? Well, I don't really want to talk about it, you know. At the heart of how we answer those questions, at the heart of how we respond to these very difficult issues that are personal for so many people, at the heart of how we live our lives, as culture says you should live this way, is an understanding that we have come to belong to the family of God in large part because God wants to use us to show the world who he is and what he is like. Just for a second, if you could say like, just ask, like, in general, I know you probably have different specific issues. Am I just embracing culture? Like if culture says it's okay, do I say it's okay? If culture says I should believe this thing, do I just believe it? Or am I more on this side? Like if culture says it and it's different than Christianity, I'm just angry about it and frustrated about it and I yell at those people and I tell them how wrong they are and I make my Facebook post to make it clear that I'm not on their side and you know, all that stuff. Like, like are you on that side? If you could just like think like what side you more generally lean to for a second and then ask yourself this question and I think this is true of both sides where does that not align with showing people who God is who God is and what God is like a a better way to express it perhaps is this In which ways does my response to culture not look like Jesus' response to culture? Because Jesus lived in a culture that was not at all like the one that that God would like. We think if we live in a God-like culture, then it would be so much easier. But Jesus lived in a culture that he was surrounded by two people. He was surrounded by the religious who had frankly rejected the things of God for their own traditions. We have a lot of that in our country. And he was surrounded by people that were just flat out heathens. I mean, the Roman culture, the Greek culture, they just didn't care a thing about the God of the Jews. And if we're looking 
to do it right. And we're thankful that God has allowed us to belong to his family. And we understand that with that belonging comes the responsibility to be a brick in the house of God, offering this world the presence of God, showing them what God is like, who God is. Then our lives, we just have to look at them and say, do they look like Jesus, <laughs> we, I just thought of this. we got to ask WWJD. Somebody thought of it like 20 years ago, this sermon. <laughs> and what I didn't see is Jesus embracing culture and saying, oh, if this is how we do it, then this is what I'll do. You know, if it's all about the traditions of the world, if it's all about Roman, the Romans and doing it like them, I'll just give in and do it like they do. I believe everything you guys believe because I don't want to make you mad. We, we just don't see much of that from Jesus. But I don't, I don't actually, correct me if I'm wrong later, but I don't know of any story where Jesus was just mad at the people that, that weren't trying to follow God. Like, hey, you're not doing it like us who do try to follow God. There was none of that. Like, hey, heathen, <laughs> idiot. You know, I, and that's kind of our attitude. And so this morning, I just want to leave you with this. You belong. If you're a Christian, you belong to the household of God. And that is an incredible gift that comes with an incredible responsibility to show God, to show people who God is and what God is like. And when we do that right, when we're sojourning correctly, when we're navigating culture in a godly way, then our lives will be a reflection of Jesus. Let me pray that we'll be able to do that. God, first, and this is, this is more the, uh, you know, the, my heart for this sermon today is that we would really get back to a place where we are grateful, God, for for all you did uh, that allows for us to belong to your family. It's, it's really hard for us, God, who have you know, kind of grown up in a Christian culture who have, didn't live before Jesus you came to, to really consider what it would be like to not be able to hold to your promises, to not know that we were in a relationship with you, to not, to not be able to pray and and know that we're being heard. To not believe God, the, the very thing that's gotten me through every, almost every difficult situation in my life, God, every hurtful, sad trial that I've gone through, and that's that no matter what I face, you are upholding me with your righteous right hand, God. And, and I pray that this morning we would ret just return to a place where we're like, wow, without the blood of Jesus without his body, thing we'll celebrate in communion in a minute, being tortured, I wouldn't have any of that. Let us be grateful for that, God. Please let us be grateful for that, God. I pray that any, any person, God, here, or any person who will listen to this sermon online that, that has not given their lives to you, I pray that they would choose to give their lives to you so that they might belong, God, to you. And then out of that, God, as we, as we celebrate your work in us, as we are grateful for, for the belonging that you have given us, I pray, God, that we would live out our responsibility. And, and why wouldn't we want to, God? I mean, why wouldn't we want to show the world who you are and what you're like when, we, when we've been so positively impacted by it? Why wouldn't we want to look at every person that disagrees with us, God, and show them that, that we used to disagree with you, but yet you loved us and gave your life for us anyway? Why wouldn't we want to? But I pray that you would compel and inspire in us just a, a longing to, to show this world what you're like and, and to live like you, Jesus. I pray these things in your name, Jesus.